1992, my country became an independent country, recognized by the whole world, accepted as a full member of the United Nations. At the same time, Bosnian Serbs, supported by Serbia, they established a part state in Bosnia called Serbian Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina. They occupied 70% of the country. They, they laid siege around Sarajevo. They ethnically cleansed, as I said, 70% of the country out of Muslims and Kurds. More than 100,000 people were killed. Disturbing images from concentration camps throughout Bosnia shocked the whole world. The world didn't do anything to save Bosnia. At the time, I got stuck with my family in Slavonica in the enclave. We lived under siege without food, without electricity, med medical supplies. You imagine living in a town move really only in a radius 12 and 9 kilometers. Nothing was functioning, no shops, no you could not go to school. There was nothing. We didn't have any food. People, people starved. Every day people were being killed. Bosnian Serbs kept tightening the siege around our town and we begged the whole world to save us, especially the United Nations. Then Philip Morion, UN commander for Bosnia, got to Treblinka and he promised a protection for our town. Just a few days later, I almost got, got killed in front of primary school. I got with my friends there to play football because we heard that that day your commander will be back to our town again. And we thought that it is a perfect moment to get to go out to, to have a, that psychological break because we couldn't endure to stay to, to out of all day locked in our houses and flat. So we thought that the Bosnian Serbs wouldn't shoot at the playground and we wanted just to play football. Well, I, got, I got there with my friends. Some youths were playing football, and I had to sit with my friends watching them play. Then I heard an explosion and all of a sudden. And as I sat on the first concrete bench, four, four meters in front of me, I saw black smoke, then, a, then an explosion. I fainted. When I got back later to my conscience, my friends around me, sitting in the back, were massacred, headless, armless, legless, covered with their human blood and tissues. I glanced at nearby towns, which served as this, this, this sports center. I saw the pieces of the human skin and hair attached to it. So 74 teenagers were killed in one country. Between that sports center. Just four days later, on the 16th of April 1993, the UN Security Council passed a resolution proclaiming Srebrenica the state of Hungary. In the meantime, we were starving, and the international community decided to drop food from the air. So in the evening, I used to go with my friends who were tourists outside Srebrenica to look for food, to wait for aircraft to drop food, and we were waiting to hear the sound of aircrafts. Someone told me that every night at least one or two parachutes will not be open, will not be able to open up. They, they somehow failed to open up. So I was scared, and I, I decided to hide under a tree with a curve above. My friend who was with me, you know, we were children and he, he used to tease me and he was teasing me because I was hiding under the tree. Then all of a sudden we heard a terrible noise. Then I knew that a parachute was not able to open up. My friend asked me what was it. I said, it will be trouble. Then parachute, a, a plane, a 
tell killing one year old boy. My friend was dizzy, he tried to push me off the tree, and he started to scream, to cry out loud. I also remember in another occasion, I went with another friend of mine to search for food. I was lucky I got some food, a package of food. I was afraid to go back down the town because I was afraid that elderly men might, might rob, rob, me, beg, rob my, my, myself. So I decided with my friend to scar the town in terms to reach the place where I used to live as close as, as it was possible. It was snow, big snow out of place. I remember I used to, I sunk into the snow. But the only thing that mattered was my food was my package of food. I didn't let it go. My friend pulled me out from the snow. In the dawn, we got in front of our building soaked, soaked bad. But actually, later, I learned that it paid off because that was the only food that got my family gone. So, Canadian soldiers came to Serbian soldiers, Serbian soldiers, as I say, you have a day disarmed Muslim soldiers. We thought that, that the UN would protect us until the end of the war. Then we started to get some food through proper roads, but that was not enough. Then Dutch soldiers came replacing Canadians in, in 1994, in January. At the beginning of 1995, Bosnian Serbs finally decided to finish off the Allies. They attacked UN positions. The UN kept fleeing from all the positions without fighting back. They didn't even fire a single bullet. Eventually, the town fell on the 11th of July 1995, which we marked as the Day of Genocide. People from, from Srebrenica fled to Dutch base outside of the town where we today have our Genesis Memorial. 30,000, hoping that the UN Dutch battalion do, would do something finally to protect them there. My mother, my younger brother were there. They hoped, they, they wanted to be allowed inside of the base. All 30,000 of people, including my mother and my, 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 my brother. But the Dutch didn't let them. They only, they only said women and babies are allowed to enter. Oh, then they started to enter through, but all people all of a sudden started to, to push in. Then Dutch soldiers closed the gates. Then Bosnian Serb army came. They killed 400 men outside. They raped women, children, children. They brought buses and trucks. They only let women, women and babies and small number of men to go by buses. They separated 2,000 of men and boys. When I say boys, they separated boys as old as 13, 14 from their mothers. All of those separated men and boys were stripped. Their personal belongings were put on a fire, on a fire and set up on fire in terms to get rid of all of this. It was clear that they, that they would be killed. All those separated men, men and boys were taken by, by, by Bosnian Serb soldiers to execution sites. As I said, only women and children, a small number of men were let go to go, to go by buses and trucks to the safety. Later, even the refugees inside of the base were not protected by Dutch soldiers. They kicked them out later, once they realized that all the refugees outside of the base were gone. Once they got outside, the same thing happened to them. Only women and children and very old men were let, go, but were, were let to board on the buses and they were shipped out to the safe fleet. More than 300 men were separated, and all of them were killed later. A few months ago, Dutch state finally ruled that they are responsible for the death of all of them. The next day, the 14th of July, nobody was there except Dutch soldiers. Later, they, they, were, they were gone to the Netherlands. At the same time, I was in the woods with my father and my, with my twin brother. We knew that we couldn't go to the Dutch base. We knew that Dutch soldiers would not protect us. We knew, we knew that, that the Bosnian Serb soldiers would, would separate us and then that they would, that they would, that they would kill us later. 
So more than 10,000 men and boys were here at the time. When the town fell, we started to march toward Britain. So we called this march the Death March. I was supposed to, to, march, to, to walk over more than 100 kilometers through, through the enemy, enemy's territory. So first five kilometers, they started to shoot. I lost the sights of my twin brother and father, and I had never seen them since. I, something from the inside kept telling me that I had to run. I was constantly pushing forward. I think that saved my life at the end. Then, next morning, I heard bullets. And I saw bullets hitting, hitting nearby trunks. Then I, I, then I knew that they were close. I told you. I got scared. And I was thinking what they would do to me before they killed me, if they would torture me before my death. So that was very painful. And I was thinking, you know, about my family, of course. If I will ever see, see them in my life. Someone was close to me and I threw away my backpack. I, th I, th I th took off my uh, coat because it, I was exhausted. I barely made a step. My friend nearby me, he gave me sugar. I had it with a gulp of water and all of a sudden I got all of my strength back and I started moving forward. Then I remember uh, early in the morning, I got on the road, I was sleeping and walking at the, same, at the same time because I had not slept for a few days before. And someone hit me, hit my shoulder, saying that there, is, there was a tank coming through the road. So I got down, the, pan, the tank had passed through. Then I got up, I got to the river. I was, I wasn't, I wasn't a soldier. I was supposed to take off my boots before crossing the river. I barely crossed the river. Then I kept on walking. Then all of a sudden, I felt something was wrong in my feet. I kicked them off in agony. Then feet, my feet, totally pliable, skinless, it was skinless. It was skinless. I ripped off my, I ripped off my, T-shirt, I put it against my feet and I put my boots back on, but still I had the trouble walking. I climbed to the highest mountain with, with some men and boys. We looked back to the road. I told you about the tank. Then all of a sudden the road was, was cut off by, by first soldiers. Lots of military vehicles. Thousands of men were outside of, of the road on another side, ambushed. They kept calling them from the roads to surrender. We heard them, I heard them. More than six and a half thousand were captured there. Then they took them to execution sites and they killed them. From the mountain, I decided to move, to, to go on, thinking about my twin brother and my mother. It took me additional five days and five nights. During the day I had to hide in the streams, in the bushes. In the evening I walked with some men and boys, holding our hands tight. I remember holding my teacher's hand, a woman. I recognized her. It was pretty dark, but I recognized her. And I remember the next day, the shooting again started. Then I heard voices of soldiers. We were trapped under siege. They kept shouting out, uh, out loud, hooray, hooray. It's, for me, it's, it was like thousands of voices. I got scared and I said to myself, today I will die. It's not that today, today. Then I saw a light on the left side and I knew that it was an artillery light. I got down, we 
because I had experience from during the war. And in front of me, 14 year old boy, his foot was blown off because of this of this uh, grenade uh, shell. He started to scream out loud, and I saw a couple of houses. I was just behind him. I saw a couple of houses, and I started praying and saying, "Please God, let him just reach those two houses. If I reach those two houses, I, I, I will survive." Luckily, I got to those two houses. Then I managed to sneak out. In the, in the evening, the rain started. It was July, but I was I just had a vision. Was cold. As I walked through the path on both sides, there were a bunch of clothes because people were walking during the day. It was hot and they were just taking off the clothes. I took a sweater. It wasn't my sweater, but it was cold. It was very cold. It was rain. The rain was so cold that we had to start a little fire in the uh, bed stream. And I had a feeling that I wanted to get inside of the fire. That, that's how cold. Because of that rain, uh, Serb soldiers were, were not able to get out from the positions. And we were so close to the prison that we managed to, to sneak out. So in the morning, I got to the first village on free territory. And I cannot even explain to you, I cannot, I'm not able to convey my feelings how I felt when you survived the hell and you reached the territory. But I wasn't happy, I was thinking about what happened to my twin brother and to my father. Then the truck came, I got on a truck, I was driven to school, to, to a school. I slept there in the morning, we had breakfast, then a bus parked. People were getting on the bus and I didn't know where to go because I didn't know where my family was. I just followed them, I got on the bus, then I fell asleep in the bus, the bus driver woke me up, then I saw a big town with traffic. He told me to get off the bus, on the bus station. Then some women came. I knew that after the Serbians, they saw me in drugs and they knew that I came as a survivor from the death march. They asked me those terrible questions about the fate of their husbands, sons, brothers, and I couldn't tell them anything. I didn't know where to go from the bus stop. A lady was looking at me from the side. She came up to me and she asked me if I had where to go. I said, no, I don't know where my family is. She, asked, she took me to her home. She fed me. She dressed me for, for two weeks. She had a son. I would put my trousers on and he, he, was, putting, he was putting a belt on my waist. He wanted to help and I always let him. I'm so grateful to that family even today. I learned later that the refugees who were uh, expelled from Serbia, women, children, are uh, Tuzla Airport. So I took a train and I walked there, waiting to find someone from my family. When I got there, I saw an endless field of white tents. Then I said to myself, "No way that I will be able to find here anybody." Someone told me that there was an administration desk that you could have your name announced. So I had my name announced, and I found my mother, my younger brother my grandfather and grandmother. I was surrounded by hundreds of women asking about the face of their relatives, and I couldn't tell them anything. I was hoping that my twin brother and the father would come alive from the woods, but they never did. It took many years to learn that they were killed, as more than 8,000 Muslims in Sweden's anyway, dumped in, in a mass graves, then later reburied to a secondary Muslims. In 2005, I buried my father, and I can tell, in, in, in 2003, pardon me, I buried my father, and I was going to a, for a burial. I was stopped by a civil police before the, before the cemetery. They, they told us that something was wrong with the, with the traffic. We got to the center of the town, Hundred, five, at least 500 of local Serbs were there. Probably the perpetrators themselves, the families of the perpetrators, yelling at us, calling us names. I was supposed to have a dignified burial of my father that day, and they, they didn't let me. They played that awful music from opening the windows of the houses. 
I got to the cemetery and I had a burial of my father. But in 2005, one of the, I one of the most difficult days in my life, the burial of my father. It took me a few months to prepare for this because I knew that I will have the burial. Because I knew I had, they identified him through DNA. So I knew that I will have the burial on the 11th of July, 2005. So I was thinking that I would die. You know, on that day, my heart was pounding. I thought that I would die. I was supposed to put his bones into the grave in our tradition. But I had to be strong from my younger brother and from my mother, and somehow I survived. If someone had told me then, that day, that I would be able in the future to work there as a curator, I would tell him or her that he or she is crazy. I am telling you this to let you know that there is always enough strength in all of us that we can push further and we can. Thank you so much for letting me to tell the story of Srebrenica genocide because it is so important. The, the whole world said after the Holocaust, never again. But we had this subsequent genocide in Bosnia, Rwanda, Darfur, etc. etc. We had to, 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 to convey the message, to remind our politicians, to educate children, not to let those wrong people to, to get in power and to mislead people. And to, it, people are always ready to do evil. We have to stop them. Thank you for keeping the memory alive. Thank you so much.